Well, good day, everyone. Good day. Ah, we're still in the midst of snow here in the northwest of the United States. <laughs> so we're still digging out today. How's life in the other parts of the world today? Sunny in Arizona. I heard you guys maybe would be getting some snow in Arizona today. What do you think? Um, we got some in the mountains last night, I think. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Flagstaff. Flagstaff can get snow because it's at 7,000 feet. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, Flagstaff would be accustomed to snow in that area. Yeah. Now, you probably wouldn't get that down like in Tucson, right? No. Flagstaff's, <laughs> Flagstaff's a great way to enjoy winter. You can drive 20 minutes and you're out of it if you need to be. Right, right. <laughs> no, that's good. Okay. Well, let me, let me go ahead and lead us in prayer as we get started today. We thank you, Father, that you've given us this new day. And uh, for some, it's uh, probably half over. <laughs> Others of ours are just getting started. But we thank you, Father, that you're in charge and control of all things. We pray that we would uh, know your will for each of us today and give us the courage and the, the ability, the wisdom, uh, to carry out your purposes uh, according to your will. Just pray, Father, uh, that you would give each one uh, wisdom as uh, we are all trying to serve you and uh, do various projects in, in various parts of your world. Just pray uh, for all of our students, Lord, that uh, they would have wisdom to carry out the uh, projects that they're involved in uh, through these dissertations and just continue to trust you, Lord, to uh, just to give us clarity. And, and understanding. Please watch over our technology today and, and let all things work well. And uh, watch over our health and uh, our families, our, our businesses, our churches, our communities. Just give us, give us your direction for each of these, uh, these areas in, in where you have us involved. It's in the name of your Son and our Savior Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> All right. I'm just kind of taking roll as people come in. We're required to do that. So, okay. Well, we're going to just take a little bit of time and uh, kind of have an open mic for for a little bit here. Uh, I'd, I'd like to know what is actually happening in terms of your your proposals, as you're getting going in the literature review, what kinds of challenges are you experiencing? Uh, as you get into researching, reading more uh, articles and uh, sources on your projects, are, are you finding that your, your topic is changing any? Are you getting some insights into possibly how to approach your, uh, your issue even a little more clearly? Let's just take a few minutes and uh, just share your thoughts openly. It's, we'll try to help each other a little bit. And then I'll, both Dr. Henry and I will probably make a few more comments on some other issues. And, uh, Dr. Henry and I yesterday were talking about the whole concept of transformation, <laughs> what that really means, uh, since we talk a lot about that, that term, and we may talk about that a little bit. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, just some of the, the theological components of the literature review, and I'll, I'll just make a few comments on that. But let's go. Just, just give me, give me your thoughts. What, what's going on as you're as you're looking at your uh, your literature review and your whole proposal, your whole approach to this project? Okay, I'll go first. I am sure. thoroughly frustrated. <laughs> <laughs> And Claire, I think about what you said in the very beginning of what a frustrating process this is and how much you have to read in order to get a little bit of what you're looking for. Um, so the question I have, though, this morning is, as I understand this project, <clears throat> as far as books to be read, um, that we're, we're looking for books that are either published by academic publishing houses or they come from um, 
research studies, and the book is the result of the research study. So it's not just um, a general popular author uh, that we're looking for. Is that correct? I'll speak to that first, and then Dr. Henry can speak to that. Uh, we're trying to, you know, I don't always like the word academic because sometimes that can, that can have some connotations that we can say, well, you know, it's just academic, you know, it's not really practical. <laughs> and we, as, as you, of course, you know, the reason you're at BGU, Bakke Graduate University, is because we really emphasize a practical approach. Uh, to whatever we're doing. Uh, we use the word practitioner and uh, more lately we've been using the word a scholar practitioner, okay? People who are doing it, who are doing work in the field are practitioners. From my perspective, we want to we want to be able to look at those sources, people who have experience doing the kind of work that you're wanting to do, uh, you know, so whether you call that academic I think if I use, I like, the, I like the word critical thinking better than academic. Critical thinking means, and Dr. Henry gave us a few, uh, gave us some PowerPoint slides on those, I think a week or two ago. But you know, critical thinking means a person has uh, supported what they're saying well by uh, their own empirical uh, observations, research, uh, their study of scripture, their study of, of other uh, authors, their study of uh, various kinds of projects around the world that people are doing to make a difference in the lives of people. So it, it's a, for me anyway, that's a little bit of a gray area to just say we just we need to have sources that are only say from academic publishing houses or uh, only empirical research oriented articles. It depends on how you're using uh, how you're needing to use those resources. Okay, but I, I like the word critical thinking. Sometimes I can read popular sources and a person will, he or she will simply be giving me their opinions uh, on uh, some issue, but they've not really uh, giving me the evidence, uh, the documentation, uh, what others are saying. So, you know, I think I was talking to Siobhan, Siobhan, Siobhan a little bit ago. We were, asked, we were talking about the issue of do we just need to have sources that are within the five, last five to ten years? Okay, depending on how you want to use a source. If you're going to use a source to uh, talk about trends within the last five to ten years, of course you're going to have to use sources that are current within that time period. If you're looking just at uh, you're looking at an article or a book that's dealing with a a concept, say a theological concept, you're going to deal with theology. Uh, see, we're talking about the, the concept of theology of work. Uh, that's going to take some, some work in looking at the scriptures and trying to understand what, what the scriptures are trying to convey when we use the term theology of work. Uh, that won't necessarily be a empirical research-oriented uh, study. It's going to be, there may be some philosophical, theological thinking involved uh, in trying to understand a theology of work. You may find some empirical studies that, that will, will lend some light, some perspectives on that issue. So that's, I guess, kind of my long answer, trying to understand what it is we're doing and, and what kinds of sources we're looking for. Dr. Henry, you want to add something to that? Um, I would say that I largely agree with what you have just explained in terms of the importance of the kinds and the quality of sources that um, are required when you are doing research and reporting research. Um, I have a little different take on the tension between the academic and the practical. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess it reflects my own educational journey. And um, I think for me, I have always merged the academic and the practical because I pursued higher education out of a commitment 
to doing practical work that I wanted to understand better how to do it, why it was done, the way it was done, etc. So that's my personal take on the, the, the relationship between the academic and the practical. Um, for the sake of um, acceptance within the academic community, and we can't dismiss the academic community, we have to acknowledge the culture of the academic committee because we are part of it mm -hmm. even though we would like to um, see ourselves more as scholar practitioner oriented scholar I think academic so um, so we have to bear in mind the culture of the academic community when it comes to doing research that culture however doesn't entomb anybody. You can break out of that culture, you can become creative within that culture, etc. And certainly um, within the academic community, we, we know firsthand the importance of the practical. So when you're doing your research, initially, initially and for all of you I could see that, you come to it from a very practical orientation and that's fine because you're trying to understand practice as you see it so you want so you're asking questions that we we term research questions because you want to get answers that will help you in your practical work in the field whatever that field may be so having said all of that I think the ongoing challenge is always to balance in terms of the literature, to balance and to relate the various strands of literature. Um, what you don't want to do is to lean too much on one side or the other. But however, if you're going to lean on one side, I would say you need to lean towards the academic. Um, there's a lot of opinion out there, etc., and opinion has its place. But opinion that is not grounded in evidence and in fact is just opinion. When you're doing research, you are doing more than proposing an opinion. You are proposing a theory, you are proposing concepts that are measurable, definable, testable, that can be explained and that will explain. I hope I haven't confused you. <laughs> so tell me what you've heard out of what was just said. What did you just hear, Lynn? <laughs> uh, error on the side of academic, number okay. one. Um, would be um, not to ignore practical, but practical is pretty gray area of whether it leans toward fact and proven um, or whether it is strictly just an opinion. Um, so how, how that person comes about that opinion kind of helps determine whether or not that's a viable source. But I, I agree that this is a dissertation, so that immediately puts it in the academic arena um so and not to ignore that I, I mean i don't know about anybody else but i want my dissertation just to get me more than some initials in front of my name i want it to be some actual helpful contribution to research that's out there so that automatically i guess for me puts it in the academic arena probably i mean i was just i like to think about words you know the word academic comes from the word academy, right? And we talk about the issue that, you know, the academy was the place that people gathered to think through and talk through the issues of the day, okay? Basically, that's what we are doing when we're talking about academics. Uh, but, you know, research involves a, a certain kind of mindset, I guess. As we go into a situation, uh, we go into a situation as observers, as learners, uh, trying to put aside our, our preconceived ideas, 
and we we try to look at a situation with fresh eyes and and, and, and you know we're trying to understand what's happening uh, in a particular situation one of our students has been working in Venezuela uh, for the last uh, few years uh, he's done his dissertation on, on that that whole area but what as he is working with trying to uh, bring together a network of quote transformational leaders in the area to deal with some of the hot kinds of situations that are going on in Venezuela he found that the majority of the leaders had not ever learned how to how to find the kind of information they they want and need about a community you know, even to even begin to begin their practical work uh, he started part of his dissertation was helping uh, leaders uh, first of all network together but then they started learning how to use some of the research out of the Catholic University one of the few uh, one of the few universities where he's at where he was at to uh, that, that is doing any kind of empirical research in trying to gather information uh, about a community. You know, he's, he's in uh, San Cristobal, I'm not saying that right, uh, but in Venezuela. And so that's, that's where this university is. And so part of his dissertation work was helping leaders learn how to use a, a university uh, re collection of, of research and apply it to the community so they could then begin to know where do we begin to start to uh, tackle, address some of the community issues that are in our midst. So again, I think as Dr. Henry has said, practical work, but learning how to do the kind of critical thinking and research that's needed so that we aren't just going into a situation blindly. Uh, Sometimes, and of course, we, we talk about, you know, two transformational perspectives. One is incarnational leadership, one is contextual leadership, okay? Uh, I was talking to somebody yesterday, one of, one of our faculty people, we were talking about doing what we call city consultations, okay? A city consultation is basically going into a community and beginning to gather the leaders from various sectors of that community to begin to brainstorm on ways to approach issues okay uh, this faculty person and i that we're talking about say there have been city consultations where people go into a, a city or into a situation with their preconceived ideas on what needs to happen we, we know that's that's been the the downfall of, of some missionary work, right? People go in and I've got the answer. <laughs> I know what you need. And we know that fails, right? Because it's not, it's not contextual. You know, contextual means I'm looking to see what God is doing in a particular situation and then joining that work. That means going to those who are already there without preconceived ideas, with humility and beginning to ask, talk with, listen to uh, those who are in the situation. That's research, basically, right? You're, you're, you're going into a situation as a listener, as an observer, before you start trying to act or before you start trying to impose your particular solutions on a situation, you go in as a listener and an observer and a, and a, hum, a humble person. That's research, you know, and, and as, as, you know, as my brother who's kind of been working in Venezuela, that, that's kind of what he, he, he was, that was a big lesson he said he learned. He had his preconceived ideas as he went into the situation, just tear, you know, all kinds of turmoil going on. But he decided, he said, I, I've got to go in as a listener, as a researcher, as one who is seeking to know what's happening here before I start trying to make anything else happen from my perspective. Well, I'll, I'll talk about where I am. Uh, I have um, felt like chapter one of the effort we've been through was um, sobering. Uh, chapter two I've, um, is somewhat terrifying. Uh, just, just trying to 
absorb everything that um, needs to be absorbed. And I, and I can't do it. I just, there's no way to do it. I feel like um, what I'm working toward is getting the form and the process right. And I, I guess I envision after this course, rightly or wrongly, I, I envision some time where I can sit back and read and just read. Um, so I, that may come through and I, I, I feel like I kind of stumbled out of the gate on this first effort, um, you know, tr trying to shape a literature review so that it's highly interactive and directional and um, is challenging, you know, and I, and, and I read, I read some of the articles, some of the critical articles or this, the research articles and the, the way they uh, communicate their own literature review is, uh, I just feel like when I read that, wow, I'm not there yet. Uh, I've got a long way to go before I can just sharply and nimbly uh, relate these conversations and these experts. So uh, I'm, I'm plugging ahead, but um, um, sobering to terror is, is the word that, um, where I kind of live. And part of it's just a schedule thing too. You only have so many hours in the day. Right. Um, so anyways, I, um, it's, it's a great process. I'm learning tons. Uh, nothing wrong with that. It's just, just, just trying to rewire my brain um, around how I process information. So that, that's, that's where I am, for better or for worse. <clears throat> yeah, that, that's helpful. You're, you're kind of touching on a, an issue I've been thinking about this last couple of weeks, about this course. You know, when you take a nine-week course, and try to uh, you know, do all kinds of reading, understand the whole process of a proposal, what is a problem statement, a purpose statement, <clears throat> what are research questions, what's a theoretical framework, uh, you know, what, is, what are theological concepts, the, I, I, and I understand it just becomes overwhelming. I'm starting to think about the idea of, you know, what's the best use of that nine week, this nine week course. And I've, I've started to think possibly a, a better, a, the best use maybe would be just to allow at least six weeks of just pure reading and studying <laughs> on your topic. Uh, you know, you mean we could have some research questions because you're trying to understand what, but you may, sometimes you don't even know how to, you don't even know how to frame the research questions until you've gotten into the literature and done some reading. So I'm starting to think maybe you can have a topic, but then you just need to start doing a lot of research, reading, getting, putting down your thoughts before you can even put that together into say a, in an organized proposal form. Now I'm, I'm just thinking out loud right now, but since you're in this class with me, with us right now, you might even just give me some, some feedback on, on that, kind of, that kind of an approach. Well, I, I think it's worth considering. I, um, I mean, because you're, you're, we're trying to understand process and we're also trying to understand content. And they were also trying to create what I would, in my world, would be a deliverable a product uh, for a grade. And those are, um, so I, I struggle because I, I think there is value in the current process. I think the rigor forces us forward. Um, I just find it easy to go on a rabbit hunt. Um, so I'm looking for literature and I go, oh, I need to read that. Oh, there's that one. I need to read that. Oh, I, sh I should read that too. I should read that. Mm -hmm. before, before I know it, I've got a bunch of articles that I really don't even know how to sort. And honestly, I don't have the time to read them. Mm -hmm. So I have to find a way to put them in a parking lot, label them and say, I got to come back to that. But maybe that's, you know, maybe there's value in that. Maybe that's part of the research effort itself that you have to manage whether you're in a course or out of a course. But those, mm -hmm. those are my thoughts. I'm thinking, you know, we, we talk about qualitative and quantitative research. You know, the, at least qualitative, the way the literature defines that is that, you know, theories, uh, ideas, concepts emerge out of, the, out of the research, say out of a series of interviews. Or quantitative, you more, you more go into a situation with an idea that you possibly want to prove, test, etc. I'm thinking as you're getting involved in a, you have a topic, 
you're maybe using a qualitative approach because you start just looking at a lot of literature, uh, looking at books that you've already used in certain courses in your BGU work, uh, using online databases to search for uh, both empirical research articles and other conceptual uh, articles. Uh, but a, a qualitative approach means I'm looking at all that content and I'm looking for theories, ideas, concepts to begin to emerge out of that, all that reading. And so, yeah, it's, it's going to be a, it'll feel like a frustrating process, but if you can maybe just have the idea, I'm looking for the, the key concepts that I believe are critical to my particular a situation. I, you know, let's use your situation, Anthony. If you're, if we were going to just, well, let me just say, what are some key words that you have used so far to do searches on on the whole planning process? Got to unmute here. Well, uh, the, the obvious ones. So planning in church, planning in small church, um, population planning, population based planning. Um, um, the, the theological angle, uh, biblical basis in planning, uh, planning in America, um, Southern Baptist planning, th those kind of approaches. What I'm, what I'm finding is there, there, there is a body of literature out there. Um, I think I'm coming somewhat from the side. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I'm finding a lot of examples. I thought I'd find maybe more examples. I'm finding conversation about planning, about the role of planning, about planning as it's somewhat almost hidden within the larger administrative uh, pressures and tasks that the church faces, uh, or the challenges upon pastoral leadership. So they touch it, but I don't find anybody, I, no, it's not true, I don't find very many that are bringing it out front and center. So I think part of it is the refining of my search, the continue to search. Some articles I find that are promising, I can't get. So I, I, I'm building a list for uh, Jennifer, I think, um, to see if she can help me get some of these. Um, so, you know, there's like a second level of reading as well that I anticipate circling in on. Um, I've heard Brad Smith use the metaphor of the funnel. I, I feel like I'm in the funnel. And, I, and um, I don't know if I'm making progress. I certainly do feel like I'm going round and round um, in the funnel. Okay. Well, I, I, I am making progress. I don't mean I, to leave that impression. I, but it, I, I, I don't know. I have no sense of when I'm going to get to the end and say, I think I've got it. I think I'm there, you know, ready to have a, a really intelligent conversation about my topic. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, so I'm finding weaknesses in my topic, it, I'm, you know, so I guess that's good. Are, are you finding, and this is the other issue as you're getting into the research, are you finding, are you still finding a need for the kind of topic that you are addressing? I, I, I would say yes for two reasons. One, the blood around the edges, uh, meaning people are seeing a problem in the local church. There's a departure from the local church. There's a, there's a diminishing of the local church. People are coming at uh, a solution for that through some angles like developing competencies. Um, well, that's right up my field. That's, but, but it's the unpacking. What are the competencies that the small church pastor needs that the seminary has not prepared him for? Mm -hmm. It's a very, it sounds like a very simple thing. We'll develop a plan, but a plan in my world must be conversational. It must be rooted in data. It must be implementable. It must be measurable. It must be communal. It must be stakeholder buy-in, you know, all these things. I, I just was never taught that. And I, and I, and I, it was always just some mystical work of God. God showed up and an amazing thing happened. That's the story. Well, and he does. I don't belittle that, but um, so there is the blood around the edges, and then there is the conversation about administering a, a, a need for better pathfinding in the administrative process within churches, and I think that's an angle too. 
So I don't know if I've answered your question, but I feel like I'm getting some traction, but I just, I just have a lot of reading to do. Okay, good. Yeah, I think that, that's, that was the thing I started this with, is that I think we need to probably allow for more time just for reading <laughs> on, on topic through, you know, at least we've got nine weeks. And I understand the time pressures on everybody, but if you've got a nine week course, they ha you have to take anyway. <laughs> it's probably a good time to begin to devote to some of that kind of reading that it's really difficult to find time to do. Others would like to contribute to this conversation. Dr. Payne, it's Siobhan. Hi, Siobhan. Um, yeah, so for me, I, I know even up to last night while I was up trying to um, you know, work on my uh, submission, I was considering the possibility as well, like, wow, this, I know when we started off the course, we uh, initially were um, required to, to look up some research articles, and uh, it, it, I guess it was implied that we should continue doing that along the way as we were creating our um, problem statements and so on. And of course, uh, we're all trying to manage time, but I think just speaking for myself, um, as I was, you know, working on my peep last night and into this morning, realized that I, in myself, wish that we had more time dedicated and focused towards this component of um, really the, the literature review, um, you know, just pulling information because I feel like going uphill, it, it was difficult at the onset even trying to, for me, find the right kinds of articles. I think Dr. Henry highlighted it early on, I, from first and second week, the articles that I had selected were just uh, opinion articles. They were not literature review, the scholarly, scholarly articles. So I, I, I was really pondering that the thrust of maybe the first several weeks being focused in such a way so that when we did make the turn uh, to, to start building, we are, there was some, uh, maybe a, more of a, a foundation. And I'm speaking of that more personally, because I almost feel like um, I've come into the project a little bit behind um, doing previous uh, undergrad and graduate work, but not having uh, a stress in the programs that I was in concerning uh, full academia. I was in IT programs, and so it was just really a programming, um, developing IT programs and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, I, I, that was a bias that I was looking at. So I found that interesting that you would state that on the course that um, maybe we, it would have been, or as you rethink the course that we uh, build some more time in for um, you know, the, the, the research component of, of pulling that in. Because I did find that uh, I was, through the feedback of both you and Dr. Henry, I was able to um, work through chapter one uh, rather smoothly, a little bit more smoothly than I thought I could. But once we hit chapter two, it felt like, what? What just happened? And so, um, you know, every adjective that each person described to, to explain what this looks like, I think became my reality and missing last week's uh, Zoom session and kind of re-listening to it, slowing it down to make sure, because I heard the difference between, um, you know, Dr. Henry's explaining, you know, to make sure that we have the, 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 the research that we're looking at, the literature we're looking at is within, a certain um, time frame and that it, it, it does have um, the scholarly aspect of what we're looking for, you know, qualitative, quantitative, all of the different pieces of it. But, and I think the question that I submitted to you was the articles that I <coughs> submitted in my post um, from my uh, poll from uh, ProQuest were, many of them were beyond 10 years. And so they were scholarly articles, but they were beyond the 10 years and they did match my fathering pieces of the five topics, or at least maybe four of the five topics that, that I'm going to hone in or at least hoping to hone in on. 
And so the reality that, oh my goodness, it's back to the drawing board, which I'm sure it'll be for quite some time, um, just because this is the nature of this kind of program. And the tension, I think, of what uh, Dr. Henry was explaining between what you think your questions are, what you think your topic is, and what, what you find out that's out there, and just kind of working through that. It, it, was a, it was a, I would say it was a healthy reality, but in, in itself, it was a reality. And, um, you know, it even had me going to my public library, which was one of the recommendations that uh, Dr. Henry made. So I was there at the library in the research section with the, you know, the librarians working with me trying to navigate my way through um, some of the, the questions that I had. But yeah, I just, I, I feel like it, it, honestly, it is par for the course based on, I guess, everyone who has done dissertation work that this is the bear that's uh, tackled along the way. It's just, um, uh, you know, digging my heels in the ground and, and, and really being honest of where I'm at and knowing that I have to apply and I really have to, as much as I like to be more intuitive in my approach, which I'm sure Dr. Henry could chuckle on, I do have to, to provide the actual factual data that, that qualifies to what I'm saying. And so, you know, in all of that I've done in faith-based worlds as well as in IT, I could speak more or write in a different kind of way, but this is a different requirement that I'm having to stretch and learn into, so yeah. Good, yeah, that's helpful. You just mentioned the word intuitive. That, that's interesting as I think about that. You can have an intuitive sense about a situation or whatever. That could be, that could be some of the, you might say something about those within the assumptions section of the, of the chapter one. I think though, as we mentioned, as we talked about the assumptions section, some assumptions you are going to actually try to gather empirical data about, you know, within your research process because you want to test that out. Other assumptions, you know, I'm a believer in God and I, I'm not going to try to prove why I believe that within my dissertation. It's, a, it's an assumption that I, I come to the table with. You know, another assumption though could be, uh, something about fathering and you, you if you're going to still work with fathering you know that the fathering role uh, is a critical uh, a critical component uh, in in the health of a child that may be an assumption that you will then try to gather some empirical data about you know through your dissertation to either prove or disprove we can you know we can just assume say well yeah of course fathering is important but you know from a research perspective, I want to go in with a blank slate. Even though I'm a Christian, you know, and I can see I can see fathering or parenting that I can see a lot of theological principles that I can dig out of scripture. From a research point of view, I want to gather empirical data that is going to support uh, my theological biblical assumptions. It makes sense. It makes sense. And I do have some assumptions down that I am trying to, um, as you've stated, you know, get the empirical data that supports it or maybe even that debunks it. You know, right. it, it, it helps me um, learn, you know, because we don't know what we don't know. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Others like to jump in with any thoughts on these? the whole concept of literature, sources, uh, putting that together in terms of a dissertation a project. One thing, let, I'll just, Dr. Henry, would you be willing just to just say a few words about what we were talking about the other day? You, you'd made some good thoughts, I think, on just on the concept of transformation. Could you share a few of those thoughts just briefly? I thought they were helpful. <clears throat> okay. Um, let me see where I'll start. <laughs> the, the concept of transformation 
is pretty popular. Um, and that makes for it for the concept being what I would call a double-edged sword. And the, the popularity of transformation has always um, been fascinating to me from a Christian perspective because it's like the other um, concept that I am fascinated about that everybody seems to be hitching on to is servant leadership. And from a Christian perspective, transformation and servant leadership are fundamental to our understanding of the Christian faith. Um, so I have been intrigued by the, 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 the world's interest in these two concepts because I, they, though they're not unique to Christianity, there is a unique, Christian focus that informs my own understanding of these two concepts. Now, having said that, when I started to study transformation and to teach transformation, I mean, it just opened up such a big world in terms of the, the concept. But I think as I listen to how people use the term transformation, I think there's a lot of shorthand to it. And that shorthand may rob us of the understanding of the complexity of the concept. Going back to, to our Christian roots, when we think of transformation um, from the Christian perspective, we are thinking of what it means to be changed to become like Christ. And now I'm going to just throw in some theology here because I've just finished teaching a class on, on sanctification. The, the concept of being changed into the likeness of Christ is um, both instantaneous and it's, there's a process to it. Um, when we become Christians, we are sanctified immediately and then we have to work out that sanctification in how we live our lives so there is the in the the the, the initial um act and then there's a process and transformation reflects that um transformation is both a process and an end point the end point of transformation is completely different to the beginning point. Hmm. So when I hear people talk about transforming an organization, in my mind, I'm th saying to myself, do you really know what that means? Because um, when we look at transformation theory and the process of transformation and the examples that we have, the living examples around us, of transformation, it takes time. Mm -hmm. And there is no one act or program that results in transformation. Transformation is a process. Having said that, going into the, the literature and the theory of it, um, transformation is about change. And there are three types of organizational change. There is what is known as developmental change. And a lot of times, I, when I hear people talk about transformation, I think they're really talking about developmental change. I'll explain it. Then there is what we call transitional change. And then there is our favorite word, the transformational change. Okay. Developmental change. All organizations need to go through that. If not, you die. It's about improvement. And that, that um, challenge to improvement is out there, depending on your organization. For example, in the, in the context of the church, just thinking, and I'm thinking of Anthony's interest in looking at planning. Um, the, the church 
the nature of the church demands <laughs> that we are always plugged in to developmental change. Um, people grow and they grow old and they die and they leave. The church is expected to grow and to move on, etc. So we have to have an awareness from, from the perspective of development. We have to have an awareness of the context of the church. We have to have an awareness of the needs of the people of the church. And yes, we have traditions of the church that are important and that we adhere to. But we always have to keep an eye on the, the, the life, on the continuing of the church. And if, if, if you don't, from a leadership perspective, um, your generation might be the last generation in that particular church because you haven't paid attention to your context and to the need, need to attract people, to mold people, to um, develop people in their gifts and ministries, etc. Lots of things. So there's a developmental change. All organizations have to attend to that. Then there's a transitional change that happens. Um, and usually organizations change and grow. And you may start off in one mold and end up in another mold. There is that transition that happens as you move to become something new. And the transitional change, what happens, um, just, you know, by way of example, is that the organization replaces itself, becomes um, something different. And that difference might be that it becomes larger, it becomes more accessible to um, members within the community or a wider group of people, etc. But there's that kind of change. And then transformational is when the organization completely alters itself. You have coming out there an emergence of a new order out of chaos. So transformational change is the ultimate change. It's the big change. Um, and there are many examples around us of transformational change. Um, we live in, in a time in the world when change is so rapid that sometimes you cannot keep up with the amount of changes. But let's just think in terms of the, um, what the invention of the computer and the personal computer has done for our society and our work life. That is an example of transformation. So whereas, and I'm speaking now to the field of education, Whereas um, in times past, education, educators and educational institutions paid a lot of attention to brick and mortar and to the investment in brick and mortar as foundational to their existence. Today, there's a challenge for educational institutions to work towards changing their mode of operation and changing how they offer courses and programs. So we have online education, which has in some instances disrupted the world of offering education and institutions that have not been able to keep up or not, are not prepared to keep up with this transformation in education have to close their doors. Mm -hmm. um, because of the challenge that it, it brings to, 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 to us. So transformation is really, um, it's big and it's messy and you don't attain to transformation by just one act or one instance. Um, my favorite example of transformation in terms of um, what happens in a country or a nation is South Africa. The change from apartheid mm. to South Africa today. And the person who stands out for me is Nelson Mandela. 
Now, when you study the life of Nelson Mandela alone, just his life, don't even go into the politics, etc. That is a, a, an example of a person who was transformed. He came from um, a brilliant background, educationally, etc. He was, uh, in some, some people would have described him as disruptive, and he, indeed he was. He went to prison, spent 27 years. Now, 27 years for a lot of people in South Africa was a lifetime because so many young people died in the struggle against apartheid. Mm. Come out, came out of prison after 27 years, a profoundly changed person, and was able to be at the helm of a transformation, a national transformation mm. that. Um, defied world expectations for South Africa. Now that is putting it in a nutshell, but when you read that, it is so fascinating. But that transformation happened at a high price for mm -hmm. thousands of people who literally lost their lives. And I think that when people think of transformation, we have to remember that part. There is a price to transformation and so when we are talking about transformation especially organizational transformation we need to be able to think through um, about the cost now there's such a thing and many times transformation is unplanned <laughs> many many times but for for planned transformation we have to look at the whole big picture and we have to recognize that there is to a certain extent we may not have control of the end product of the transformation that we are proposing there is there is an unknown part to it but what i do say is that apart from that unknown be ready to anticipate and to recognize that there is going to be a cost to transformation. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when people face the cost of it, they don't necessarily want to do it when they recognize what it would cost, but you have to think of the cost of it. I think one of you, um, I think Melvin is doing a study that definitely inherent in it is the whole issue of the cost um gentrification gentrification has a cost to it and because of the cost there are so many people who are against the process of gentrification but there's a sense in which we have to recognize that in many instances gentrification is inevitable what we probably need to be thinking about is how do we work to allay the cost of gentrification, especially the cost to the less fortunate mm -hmm. and those who have no voice. So I just stop there. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Henry. I, that was helpful when we were talking and I thank you for just kind of going into more detail on that issue because we've, like I say, we, we, we use the term transformation a lot at BGU but I, I think as Dr. Henry has said, we have to just even understand, even when we're looking at a particular project, what is the scope of the kind of transformation we are looking for in the kind of, within the context of what we're doing, you know, developmental change, transitional change, transformation. Uh, those are all words, you know, we talk about change management. When I teach the course on uh, organizational assessment. We talk about change management. There's all kinds of literature on change management and you know what it takes to take an organization through uh, this, a series of transformational steps or uh, change steps. Uh, one of the books, I think for this course, and it's a bit dated now, The Diffusion of Innovation by Rogers, I think is one of, one of the ones that was on the reading list. I'm not sure if it's still on the required list or not, but anyway, he kind of talks about the whole issue of how innovation uh, are introduced into particular, in, in particular cultures, you know, and you get resistance, 
you get those people who are the you know the early adopters who adapt to a, a situation you got the the laggards the ones who just you know never really catch on till possibly the end you know all kinds of uh, concepts principles that we can observe when, when we're looking at change transformation and so you know when we talk about a dissertation at BGU we ask that it have some level of transformation <laughs> okay we even talk about a transformational strategy but I think as Dr. Henry has pointed out we need to even define that you know what exactly are we what is our expectation in the level of change or transformation that we're expecting to see based on the limited kind of work that we can do through a, a dissertation process? Okay. Any thought, any other thoughts on that whole issue? Okay. I'm going to change gears just for a moment then. I'm going to share my screen. What I was thinking here was, you know, one part of the literature review deals with the theological or the biblical principles that are related, relevant to your particular topic. We used to devote a whole chapter to, to that issue, but then as we were thinking about it as faculty, we decided that the theological uh, section could be a part of the literature review because the literature review deals with what we call, we've used that term, the theoretical framework uh, for a project. You know, and we, uh, you know, we, we talked a lot about different uh, the theoretical frameworks, uh, you know, and, and we've, we've dealt, you've all dealt with that a little bit in terms of what are some of the principles, approaches, theories, etc., that are relevant to your particular topic, okay? We're doing the same thing when we're thinking about biblical or theological uh, principles that are related. You know, I just started to brainstorm you know, we, we've got the big word transformation, and we, we just talked about a little bit about that. We can look at that from a theological point of view, as Dr. Henry said, you know, from a, from a Christian point of view, we, you know, the Greek word, of course, is met, metanoia, okay, where we get the word metamorphosis, okay, change, okay. Uh, that, when it's often translated, of course, repentance in, in the Bible, it simply means to make a 180 degree turnaround. Okay, that is a radical transformation, right? You're going in one direction, you make a 180 degree change and you go the other direction, okay? That is what we would call the beginning of a Christian life. We call it conversion, repentance, whatever you wanna call it. Uh, but that is a metamorphosis, okay? A caterpillar becomes a butterfly through the process of metamorphosis, okay? So transformation, has a theological uh, component. You could look up the word transform. Uh, I just looked up Romans 12 too. You know, don't be conformed to this world, be transformed by the renewal of your mind, okay? We could look at that and see what does that, what does that mean? Uh, there's another place in Corinthians, it's in chapter three, it's in first or second Corinthians, it says, uh, you are being transformed from one degree of glory to the next, and this all comes from the Holy Spirit. And we know that's you know, the theological word sanctification. So, you know, we've got transformation in terms of being uh, 180 degree turn, okay? Repentance, metanoia. But then you've got this word sanctification, which simply means to become holy <laughs> or to become whole, or you're becoming conforming, as Paul uses the language in chapter eight of Romans, being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, right? So we could talk about the word transformation from a theological point of view. And that's what we're asking. Uh, in, in a section or two, however your literature review works out, you would, you would use, you would, look, you would look for theological concepts that you can talk about uh, from a theological point of view 
uh, but they are all part of your theoretical framework. You know, and I, I just, yeah, I put transformation to the top. It was down here. But, you know, theology of work is a, that's a theological concept that you could, that a lot of students use uh, in some of the theological sections of their dissertations. Okay, we, could, we talk a lot about theology of work. Dr. Peabody, Larry Peabody, teaches a whole course on theology of work. What is that and how does that relate? You know, if I'm thinking of uh, for benefit corporations, does the, the term of theology of work apply as we're looking at Lynn's uh, work? Okay, I think it would. We, some of the different concepts that we talk about when we talk about transformational leadership, you know, servant leadership, incarnational leadership, contextual leadership, shalom oriented leadership, those are all con theological concepts that can have some relevance uh, to your topic. I was thinking of your Ch 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 Chavon, you know, parent-child relations. We can find a lot of content in the Bible on that. Marriage relationships, uh, business purpose and ethics. We can find contact on that. The whole t concept of reconciliation, justice, social responsibility. Those are all theological concepts that may or may not relate to your particular project. So that would be my challenge to you as you're thinking through that part of a literature review chapter, think about some of those big theological concepts, principles uh, that may relate to your particular topic, okay? And again, we're, we're pressed up against the issue of the time factor, I understand that. When we used to do the, uh, uh, the the whole chapter in the proposal was called the Theological Foundations or Theological Reflections chapter. Uh, what I would ask students to do is try to come up with, you know, at least three topics that seem to relate. They are biblical principles that seem to relate to your topic. And then I just ask, you know, try to find a scripture that relates to that that topic that principle, and then uh, try to find at least three uh, authors, three sources that relate to that particular topic. And I think I, I wrote down some of that, I think, in, in one of the files uh, on, on, on this week's uh, lesson. So that's, that's what I'd ask you to do when, you, when you're working on that part of the theoretical, not the theoretical, the literature review. Try to come up with, you know, two or three topics that fall under that that whole theological theoretical framework uh put down you know one or two scriptures that seem to uh highlight that that issue and then uh, come up with uh you know two or three authors that uh that you've looked at you don't have to have read them completely just put those authors down and say these seem to be some authors that will help me uh, develop this particular topic uh, in, in, my, in my dissertation. I'm really, even as I'm talking about this, I'm feeling this, this big pressure of time that, that you're, you're all feeling. I'm thinking what I would like to do for the next couple of weeks, to let you just keep working on this, this literature review, coming up with these these ideas, these, these principles, both from the secular and the theological uh, perspectives, at least try to get those, you know, get those listed and just try to put some content under those, okay? And let's, maybe we'll just even work on those for the next couple of weeks. What I think we may do, uh, if, this is, if this seems okay with everyone, Let's go ahead and let's go ahead and extend working on this this literature review chapter and, and just keep looking at literature uh, this week and next week. And then maybe the final week we will talk about the research methodology, which should grow out of some of the uh, some of the thinking and reading you're doing. Okay, uh, so I think we, we'll just maybe spend the last week just kind of giving you some ideas on what a research methodology looks like, and then you'll be able to work on that more uh, as you are you know, working on the, the proposal 
because you've got, I think, two or three weeks two or three weeks after this after our online section is done to uh, keep bringing this this proposal to some kind of a conclusion for the class even when you bring this proposal to a conclusion for this class it's not completed at that point by probably by any means uh, you will then need to be uh, talking with a your, whoever becomes your supervisor talking through this process talking through some of the ideas that you have looked at in this class so you can finally put that down and you'll eventually come up with a, a finished proposal that you'll be able to submit to the academic cabinet. Uh, sometime, if you'd like to graduate in 2020, June, you'd need to have that proposal to the academic cabinet by, I think it's June 30th. You have to look at the handbook to see, but it's sometime in June of this year, you need to have that proposal completed and submitted to the academic cabinet if you'd like to graduate uh, in uh, June of 2020. Okay. Feedback, thoughts. So, Bill, do you first of all thank you. I think that's really helpful. Um, do you want to see from us in our assignment this week just us pushing the effort forward? Do you do you want to see? something submitted that is movement from last week to this week that forwards the effort? It helps me. I mean, I, you're all going to be in a little different place. If, you know, the main reason you submit any work to me or for, for Dr. Henry and I to see is for us to give you our feedback. <laughs> if you want feedback, then you need to submit the assignment. You know, the bottom line is you need to have a proposal done by the end of this course, you know, in, 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 a, in, a, in kind of a draft form, okay, not completed and say and then I've just kind of given you the time frame but yeah this week I think I'd ask if you can at least submit uh, last week and this week you know submit the the topics if you want to start doing some writing and get our feedback on that that would be good I think this week you're, you're also trying to come up with some of these uh, theological concepts that would be part of your your theoretical framework so yeah if you can submit anything this week and and I'll give you my feedback, that's great. If you don't get it done, I'm, I'm not gonna press you, but uh, again, as much as you can stay on task and get feedback from, from us as, as your, you know, your facilitators in this process, I think you're, you're better off. Well, the feedback is great, it's re really helpful. Okay. Yeah, and that, that, I mean, that's the whole purpose of trying to submit something on a weekly basis. Uh, again, I don't want you to feel like, you know, if you, don't, if you just can't make it this week and get it done, okay, I understand that. But I also know when you get to the end of the process and then you've got so much work to catch up on, that's craziness too. So, you know, I really try to encourage students to try to discipline yourself to get something submitted each week to get some kind of a feedback. Bill, this is Lynn. Go um, ahead, Lynn. Yeah, this is a huge help because to me that frustration when I try to think about what am I frustrated about? It's trying to write a paper before I have the reading sufficiently done to write the paper. And it's right. always changing as I read. So I feel like I'm spinning wheels here, just trying to commit to a deadline that I really am not ready to formulate what's being asked. Uh, so this is a huge help. Um, and just as a suggestion, I wondered if for your benefit, if it would be possible to switch to writing journals I know journals is not normally how this class is conducted, hmm. which would give you the idea of what is it we are processing, but not in a formal way that fits into your template. Mm -hmm. that's, an idea. An, that's an excellent idea. Let me give some thought to that. Yeah, because uh, I think that's mainly what we want to be doing is trying to look at the thought process that each of you are going through and seeing if that seems reasonable in terms of uh, what, what we know the end product is going to need to be. I think there's some, there's some advantage of trying to put down some formal writing just to, uh, uh, you know, get something down to get some feedback on it. But I, I like that idea of the journaling, because I, I could say we've not used journaling in this particular class, but uh, I, I think as you're talking, there could be some advantage to that process. Yeah. So that, and then just allowing a lot more time in the initial weeks, even say the first half of the course, just to do a lot of reading. Uh, 
but yeah, unfortunately, you guys, you guys are kind of, you know, working through this process uh, with us. <laughs> and, and, and Dr. Henry and I have been doing a lot of talking. Uh, you know, I've, I've been with the school since its inception in 1990. <laughs> and so I've been, a, I've seen a lot of the process. It's helpful to me though, to, you know, I, I've been a pastor most of my life and then I've done teaching. Uh, Dr. Henry has a lot of good experience, you know, in uh, organizations, Christian organization, but she also has a lot of good research experience. And so she brings that to the table. And so as we kind of bring a lot of these different perspectives to the table, hopefully we are improving uh, the process. You know, we talk about the developmental change. <laughs> hopefully we're continually improving uh, this process of putting together a dissertation at BGU. And it's, a, it's an ongoing developmental process. And then that's fun. That's what we're all about. So I just appreciate your, your input uh, to this process and your, since you're going through this process right now. But like I say, at least the two things that come to me right now is just allowing more time for reading, uh, maybe not expecting the formal uh, proposal pieces every week, uh, take that pressure off, you know, you're going to have to have that done by the end of the course, at least a draft. So, and then, so just allowing more time for reading and possibly the journaling maybe would be a helpful uh, process where you're not having, you're not, and of course the discussion, you do some of that in your discussions. And I think that's another place. Uh, Dr. Henry, this term has been watching over the discussions. And so hopefully, uh, you know, and you've done some good, good, in, good uh, interacting with each other. Uh, when I look at this course or any course at BGU, I consider us all at some level experts in various aspects of, of business, uh, theology, uh, life, whatever you want to call it. And so, you know, we are a group of colleagues coming together and wrestling with issues. You know, some of us have done some more study and thinking in the whole area of research. Uh, and so we bring that to the table. Uh, but, you know, you all have expertise to bring to the table, and, and that's what I, what I like about the discussions in, in, a, in a BGU class. We're colleagues coming together, sharing our perspective on whatever the topic happens to be for that particular week. Um, Dr. Payne, I have some input, if, if that's okay. Absolutely. Um, I, I love the idea of extending the, um, this, this, um, literature area um but i also feel the tension of uh we do have that final chapter and i wondered if perhaps even as you're extending this right for this area if we could um without the pressure of the deadline of still run them concurrently because um and, and maybe i'm speaking for selfish reasons i know i'm still trying to to learn the process myself, but you know, for what I was able to throw in, which were the topics, um, uh, my theoretical three areas of which I would classify as my uh, theoretical frameworks, as well as the um, some research articles that I was looking at, which I still didn't delve into. I think it created enough tension, but but you've taken the pressure off that I still feel the you know, to, to push into that, um, but without the pressure of the deadline, but also knowing that by week nine, we're going to run out of time. And so, so yeah. I love the idea, like I said, of um, having the extension, but I also would not want us to hit week nine with a chapter three to be covered, and we only have one week to actually discuss it. So. I, I'm only making a suggestion if perhaps uh, the first 30 minutes we're discussing our research, you know, the challenges that we're encountering, and then maybe the next we're uh, discussing with the other um, chapter would be uh, as we hit into that so that we don't um, brush up against week nine when we're no longer doing the online piece. And I'm sure, I'm, I mean, I don't know. I know I've reached out to you. We've had Zoom session. I send you notes. You respond back. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, once we hit after the online session, then we still have to make our submission by the end of March. And then, of course, uh, submit it to the academic committee 
um, by the end of June. And I am just concerned that we don't run up against uh, with extending this, which is fine, but maybe if we could do something a little bit, kind of walking them together uh, or, or seeing how that works so that we are not trading one thing for something else that may end up being uh, some once we get into that as well. So that's just my thoughts mm -hmm. on it. That, that's really a good observation, Siobhan. Uh, I think, uh, Siobhan, yeah. It's, I think based on what you just said, I think it would be good for us to at least get all the information out uh, to talk about. So next week, you know, we'll go ahead and do some presentations on the research methodology chapter, even though you don't need to have that, that done. Uh, Dr. Henry has had some good PowerPoints on, on that whole concept, and, and then I've got some ideas that I like to put forth too. So I think, uh, I think we, will, we will go ahead and get the information out. So once, once you've got at least the information, you're reading about it, of course, but sometimes it helps to verbalize it and go through it in a, in a Zoom room. Uh, you, you're, you're reading, uh, you know, Cresswell, and you're reading Miriam and, and Sensing, and, and they all have a little different uh, uh, perspective on, on how the research methodology uh, works. So, yeah, I think that's a good idea. We'll at least get the information out next week. But then once everybody now will, will, will probably you know, be on, have some of the same content, we can then keep talking you know, next week and the following week about the whole process and how it comes together uh, into that into that proposal. Does that that make sense to everybody? Okay, I see a thumbs up there. Thank you. All right. All right, I was just looking at the chat room making sure that I'm getting everything here. All right, I think we do need to close down. Uh, we've been at it for about an hour and 15 minutes. Just to be clear, uh, if you can turn something in this week and you'd like feedback, you need to do that, okay? But uh, I'm trying to take some of the pressure off. If you just feel like you just need to keep doing reading and that's what you want to spend your time doing this week and, and next week, you can be doing that. But I guess I, at the same time, I encourage you to write some, some content because I think it's just helpful to get feedback uh, on, on your writing and what you're doing. Okay. Any more thoughts, questions before we close down the session today? All right. I'm going to let you go and uh, just keep keep going at it at the end discussion uh, this discussions. I think those are very good. Just to keep bouncing ideas off each other, and and Dr. Henry is paying a more spe a specific attention to those discussion boards. And, and, and she always has this great input, I believe, uh, on, on, on these issues, okay? All right, this session has been recorded. If you need to go back and listen to it, uh, I'll put the recording out as I always do. It takes a few hours to get it uploaded and, and everything that needs to happen, but I'll go ahead and do that and then send you the link. And we will get together again uh, next week, same time, same place, all right? Thanks for all your Hard work, and I know it's hard. All right, bye for now. Goodbye, thank you, have a great week. Goodbye, thank you. Bye.